Welcome to MOOC course on Introduction to Proteogenomics. In the last few lectures, Dr. Kelly Regels have given you a very detailed insights of genomic revolution studying genome and transcriptome. Today she is going to talk about epigenome. The epigenomics deals with the modifications in expression and function of genes due to the addition of different functional groups. Today will be Dr. Kelly Regal's fourth lecture and she will talk about epigenomics and use of chip seek technology to perform epigenomics studies. Various type of publicly available databases like CPTAC, the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA and ENCODE will be described. She will also talk about the DNA seek where one can sequence gene by using DNAs and then compare them with the reference genome. The lecture will also illuminate about DNA methylation and whole genome bisulfide sequencing known as WGBS which can facilitate in finding sites of methylation. However, because of high cost and inefficiency of reduced representation bisulfide sequencing is preferred over WGBS. Dr. Kelly will further talk about the role of epigenetics in histone modifications leading to expression of different genes. She will also cover the high C which helps in understanding the interaction and folding of chromosomes with neighboring chromosomes or within itself. So, let us welcome Dr. Kelly Regels for her lecture today. I'll talk about is epigenomics. Um, so, there are lots and lots and lots of methods for epigenomics. I feel like they're constant. I have collaborators that come, with, come to me with more and more of these methods that are slightly different and have new names. Um, but I'm, so I'm just going to talk about some basic ones. Um, but you'll read, if you go into depth with this, you'll read about more and more of these that there seem to be hundreds, um, but they're all slightly different. They're all doing similar things. Um, so ChIP-seq, which is um, we're going to talk about in a lot of detail, but this is really trying to identify DNA-associated proteins. Um, DNA-seq, which identifies uh, active genes based on DNA hypersensitivity. Um, Hi-C, which is um, cross-linking DNA to understand how, because the DNA is sort of folded on each other, uh, on itself in the nucleus, so understanding how certain parts of the DNA interact with each other. And then bisulfite sequencing, which is looking at methylation status, and I'll talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. So ChIP-seq is combining um, sequencing with a chromatin immunoprecipitation, so what you do is you have to pick proteins of interest. So let's say you're interested in a certain transcription factor or you're interested in a modified histone. Um, there's all sorts of things that you, any protein that you're interested in that interacts with the DNA, right? You can pull down that protein and then look at what sequence is associated with it is essentially the theory behind this. So you extract DNA from your nucleus and you, when you extract the DNA, there are proteins that are bound to the DNA. And then you cross-link them with formaldehyde, so you know that they, are, they continue to stay bound to the DNA, and then you do this, um, chrom this chip um, immunoprecipitation, meaning you have an antibody against whatever protein you care about. You pull down all of the protein, or not all of it, but some of the protein within your sample that's attached to DNA sequence, and then you, um, you take the DNA fragments that were attached to that protein and then you sequence them and you align them to the DNA. So you know whatever protein you're interested in, these are the sequences that it's interacting with. And this is a typical, so this would be a, trans, uh, the CTCF would be the protein, and then you would pull down and you can see that there's a lot of reads in this area here. Um, and you could look at RNA polymerase, you could look at a methylation status, so you can look at a whole bunch of different, anything you can kind of pull out your sequence um, after you do this hybridization, um, you can look at with this kind of a method. Did, any questions so far? Okay. Um, DNA seq um, is a way of looking at gene activation. So um, there are. It's been shown that uh, that regions of the genome that are hypersensitive to DNA are are active. So what you can do is you can cleave DNA with DNAs, 
And then you can look at the, you can kind of look at where the, the, the sites that it's cleaved. And then you can take the chunks that are closest to that cleavage and actually just sequence those. So you can see where, wh what regions of the genome have, are sensitive to DNAs because they were able to be cleaved and then pulled down um, using these, uh, these uh, Dyna beads. Um, so in addition to that, you, again, you can look at the structure of the chromatin. So genes are packed within this heterochromatin. Um, and the genes that are packed within it are not expressed. Um, so there's lots of different modifications that occur on chromatin to sort of open it up and make it available for expression. And there's lots of ways of measuring um, openness and activity based on, um, on understanding how this chromatin structure occurs. So for example, um, histone acetylation, um, the loose, if it's acetylated, it, it actually loosens up the structure and allows for some transcription. So you can measure levels of this. Or you can measure um, the addition of methylation groups. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you do that and what that means. So DNA methylation, I think, is the most, one of the more commonly used epigenomics methods just because it's like one of the easier ones when you're doing a whole genome analysis. There, I'm not going to show a slide on this, but there are also methylation arrays that are similar to the arrays we talked about where you have different methylation um, areas of, uh, where you can measure specific patterns of methylation on the genome. So you, you have a, just a chip and you put your, your DNA over it and then you can measure levels of methylation in different areas. Um, but it's been shown that um, adding methylation to, um, to the DNA actually reduces transcription. So if you have a methylation, um, the, the transcription is lower. And I'm, that's a generalization. There's lots of, inter like, this is a complex system, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, that's sort of the idea. So by measuring methylation, you're, you can measure how active certain genes are. Um, and the ways besides this methylate, the methylation chip, there's also this whole genome bisulfite sequencing, or WGBS, where you bisulfite treat your DNA, and it converts all of the unmethylated cytosines to uracil, which are then read as, this, uh, as T in when you sequence it. And then you can kind of deal with this in the, in the informatics side. So you know that every time there is an unmethylated C, it's turned to T. Um, and then you have a control where you don't do, do this by sulfide sequencing. And so then you can look and see, you just do a whole genome sequencing of your bisulfite and your non-bisulfite treated sample. And then you can look and see um, which ones were methylated and which ones weren't. This is just super expensive. Not a lot of people do it because it's essentially whole genome sequencing times two because you have to have a bisulfite and a non-bisulfite sequence sample. So it's one way of doing it, but again, it's, it's really expensive. So they've come up with a different approach, which is called reduced representation by sulfite sequencing, or RRBS, where it combines that method with restriction enzymes. Um, so you can enrich for specific sites that have more, um, more of these methylations occurring, so these CPG sites, um, using a specific restriction enzyme. So it's a methylation-sensitive restriction enzyme, so meaning that it will cut if there's methylation and not cut what if there's not. So it allows you to just get rid of a whole bunch of stuff you don't care about. So it takes your whole genome sequence and it, it, it makes it only 1%. So it takes things that you do care about. So this is a more common method. Um, I work, have worked with this data and it's a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, but it's science and that's what we do. So uh, <laughs> it is a method that is available as well. And um, I'll include this here, I'm not going to go through all of it, but there are, these are different modifications and um, sort of how they have been shown to be involved in changing expression um, of genes. So there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, modifications, methylation modifications and histone modifications that can occur. Okay. So um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, I think, for the epigenetics is this high C. So this is um, studying how the 3D structure of how the actual um, chromosomes are sort of folded on themselves and with other chromosomes. So here is, um, this is a figure I took from this paper. 
that just shows um, models of how these, these are each colors, a different chromosome, and how they're, how they're, the architecture of the chromosomes within the nucleus. So you can see they're folded on themselves and folded with other chromosomes, and how they interact with each other is something that's become um, of great interest to a lot of people. So how we measure this is um, using this um, chromatin confirmation capture, or HI-C, um, which allows you to look at how these, um, these chrom the chromosomes are folded on each other. So what happens is you, um, you cross-link your DNA um, and then fragment it using restriction enzymes. So you, so you have your DNA folded on itself, and then you, again, cross-link it so it's, it's stuck together, and then you cut it up, so then you have stuck together small pieces. And then you, um, so here, that's here, and then you, um, you cut with the restriction enzyme, then you sort of cap the ends, and you ligate them together. So you take these two pieces that were interacting and you just ligate them so they're circular. And then you remove these, um, you, you end up shearing it, making it into pieces, and then sequence them. So you end up getting an area here, right, this piece that you ligated, where it's these two different parts of DNA that could have come from totally different chromosomes that are now ligated together. And so you're really just interested in this, where this ligation occurred. So areas where things that don't make sense that they're connected are connected. And then you do the sequencing, and then you can see what it looks like is connected um, together. And you get things that look like this. So this is um, chromosome 14, how it's folded on itself. Um, and so you can see different patterns of where certain, certain parts of the chromosome is folded on itself. So this is just using different restriction enzymes of chromosome 14 and looking to see how the, the ligation patterns and how the, these, these, um, these uh, areas here are connected throughout the chromosome. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to just touch on was these publicly available data sets. So the first is the TCGA. Has, every, has, has anyone heard of the TCGA? Some people. You're going to hear a lot about it <laughs> this week. So. Um, so the TCGA is a collaboration between the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute. And what they, they have done is generated uh, genomic maps of 33 tumor types. Um, and then there's ENCODE, which is another of one of these large consortiums um, where it's really looked at epigenetics, so all of the, the parts list of the functional elements. So they've done a lot of the epigenetic work, in, mostly in cell lines. And so the TCGA has been working for many, many years and has, you know, has, has published a lot of these um, papers just, that are just sort of characterizing specific tumor types. So characterizing breast tumors, characterizing ovarian tumors, looking at what mutations occur a lot and what subtypes exist in those tumors. And recently, um, with, in the last few months, there was this pan cancer atlas that was uh, published where they took all of the tumors, it didn't, didn't matter what um, cancer it came from, and they analyzed them all together. So this is 11,000 tumors. They had a lot of these different um, sequencing levels that we've discussed, so SNPs, copy number, RNA-seq, DNA methylation. And if you're interested, there is, um, I included it here, there is a collection of 27 papers that go through all of the many sub-projects that came out of this. Um, and so if you're interested, you can take a look at that here. There's a lot of information there on these papers. And with that, I wanted to also introduce um, the Clinical T Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium, or CPTAC. So um, many of the speakers who are here, including myself, have been involved in CPTAC for many years. Um, and the goal of CPTAC is to accelerate the understanding of the molecular basis of cancer through the application of large-scale proteome and genome analysis. So we're really trying to take what the TCGA did and make it a proteogenomic analysis of cancer and trying to figure out what more we can, we, we can gather from using proteomics that we weren't able to understand using the genomics. So you can see here there's a lot of people involved in this. Our meetings are giant. Um, and we always have to take a picture, which is, <laughs> which is good because it's good for these talks. Um, so the first, uh, the last iteration of CBTAC um, really just took, 
tumors from the TCGA and looked at them at the protein level. So in this, this um, we looked at breast, ovarian, and colorectal. These papers have been published already. Um, everyone except for Bing, who's not here yet, worked on the breast analysis. So you're going to hear a lot about the breast CBTAC data. Uh, you'll be very familiar with it. There were about 100 samples per tumor type. And um, we took the same samples that the TCGA had done, a subset of them, and then we did proteomic analysis on them, and then we did some in integration of the, the, of the data types that you'll hear about from many of the people today. Um, and now the next iteration of CBTAC, which was, is ongoing, we are now looking at a pro prospective tumors, meaning tumors that were not collected by TCGA. They're being collected specifically for CBTAC. Um, and there are nine tumor types total. Um, and uh, three of them are repeats, so they're prospective samples from breast, ovarian, and colorectal. And then there's about 100 samples that are collecting for these other tumor types as well. Um, again, doing the same types of analysis and trying to better understand cancer by integrating all of these different methods. Yeah, the blues are the ones that we did the, la the, the last time and that we're repeating with perspective, but that we've already kind of looked at. And then the reds are the new ones that are, yeah, totally new. The homogeneity of all these type of cancers, like, you know, the question raised many times is <coughs> the cancer tissue itself is very heterogeneous. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem we talk about a lot. Um, and we know kind of the pathologists will look and see how heterogeneous, they, they can actually predict like how much tumor versus non-tumor we have, and we do a, a try and account for that. Um, we don't do single cell RNA-seq on these. Uh, it, it's just out of the scope, so yeah. Because it's also written that uh, you tried for match normals wherever possible. Yeah, we did try for match normals, which has been complicated. So you could kind of take the normal tissue around the tumor? Yes, that is the goal. Is, and for some tumors, it's easier to use match normals than for others. It's harder to find match normals for certain things, like breast tumors, right? Because breast tissue is very fatty. So match normals in breast is harder than in lung, for example, right? The case would be with bioblastoma. Yes. And how yeah. Get normal yeah. From it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a challenge, but it's it's the goal is to have match normals because we it would be better to have a normal thing to compare our cancer to. So we're going to look at the at the the subset of the TCGA breast cancer study that was used for the CPTEC study. So. Um, I just wanted to introduce the breast TCGA study. So this was a study that was published, I think it was in 2012, where they looked at 825 breast tumors. They did exome sequencing, DNA, copy number, methylation, um, mRNA and microRNA expression. Um, and then subtypes the, these breast tumors based on a PAM50 model, which is a typical way of subtyping breast tumors. I'll talk a little bit about what those subtypes are because you'll probably hear about them a lot this week. And then identified, a gene, identified genes with somatic mutations um, in, in different um, samples. So they were really just characterizing breast tumors from a genomic perspective, looking at the epigenetic drivers. So then um, last year, we published a paper that looked at the, a subset of these tumors, so 77 of these tumors, at the protein and phosphoprotein level. And this is the paper. Um, and this paper really looked at how um, the DNA mutations and protein signaling were connected. Um, we looked at uh, druggable kinases in patient-specific manner, and it really um, was to provide a resource for the community, um, just like the TCGA did, but now adding proteomics and phosphoproteomics to it. So for this, for the, this hands-on, we're just going to look at the genomics data since that was what I was tasked with. So we're not going to do a proteomics analysis yet. But we're just going to look at some of the, the, the TCGA-based genomics data from the 77 samples that we looked at. And just wanted to mention that there, these PAM50 um, subtyping was done for the tumors. So th there, there are four different subtypes that you'll hear about, luminal A, luminal B, HER2, and basal-like, and they all differ in terms of prognosis um, and in terms of um, how these patients are actually treated. So there, there's a, there's been subtyping, um, and you'll see that throughout many of the figures. 
Um, the the basal-like are typically the, have the worst prognosis, so that's something that we tend to focus on quite a bit. Okay, so for this hands-on, the objective is really to, so this is figure 1B from the Mertens et al. paper. And so what we wanted to do was to have you explore a lot of this genomics data that was used in this paper using a publicly available website, so CBioPortal. Has anyone used CBioPortal before? Okay, great. So that you'll hopefully enjoy it. Okay, so I just wanted to introduce CBioPortal. So it actually was developed by Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, and it's hosted the, in their Molecular Oncology Center. At this point, um, there's a lot of people working on it. It's, it's one of these huge, they've done a really good job of, of hosting uh, large amounts of cancer genomics um, data. So they've actually taken the TCGA in addition to some other data sets and actually have it readily available on the website. So you don't have to download anything. We didn't want you to have to download lots of enormous files. So you can just play with the data and explore the data on the website. So in conclusion, I hope today you have learned what is epigenetics and various methods which could be used for analyzing the DNA methylation in a given gene. You also learned about high throughput approaches like WGBS and RRBS which could help in searching and analyzing DNA methylation in the gene. We also learned that chromatin conformation capture high C may help in understanding the folding and interactions of chromosomes with adjacent or self genes using different set of restriction enzymes. Dr. Ruggles also briefed about TCGA and ENCODE which are publicly available databases containing very useful genomics and epigenetics information. In the next lecture, Dr. Ruggles will be giving a hands on demonstration on how to use C bioportal for accessing gene mutations and its expression in published data sets. I hope these lectures are giving you not only understanding about you know how to analyze genome, transcriptome and even you know epigenome, but also giving you information for various repositories, databases and software tools available which could be freely available and can be utilized for your own research. Let us continue this discussion about genomic technologies in the next lecture. And then we will have you know another transition in the concepts and we will have another speaker to give you more fundamental concepts. Thank you.